Well, good morning. Welcome to Laurel Hill Bible Church. Glad that you are joining us today on either Facebook or YouTube. Just did want to let you know that we've planned a really special Christmas Eve service here at Laurel Hill Bible Church. We are planning on a parking lot service. Uh, we would love for you to come on out, dress warmly. Uh, our plan is to have it Christmas Eve outside. We're, uh, you know, it's 2020, so who knows whether or not the weather will cooperate. But, but we believe it's going to be a very meaningful Christmas Eve service. It should be about a half hour long. We're planning it again for Christmas Eve at 5.30 and 7 o'clock. Uh, if because of the weather we have to make any changes, just keep in contact with the church as the weather uh, picture seems to, uh, to shape up as we get to the beginning uh, of next week. Let's have a word of prayer as we look into God's word this morning. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. And thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ coming into this world on a rescue mission. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Thank you, Lord, for your incredible love for us. And Lord, I just pray that our hearts would be drawn to you this morning as we look into your word. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What's your favorite Christmas song? It's a question that was posed to uh, Americans in a recent poll. Here are the top three answers. Number three, White Christmas by Bing Crosby. That's kind of old school. Number two, All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey. A little much newer than the Bing Crosby song. The number one song picked by Americans as their number one favorite Christmas song is Silent Night, written by an Austrian priest in 1816. The story behind Silent Night was the church organ was broken and they were, they were desperate to get some music for their Christmas Eve service. Joseph Moore, he was the Austrian priest, he contacted the choir director Franz Gruber. And, and he said, I've written a poem, I wrote a poem about two years ago, and if you could put music to it, I could play the guitar and you could sing it. And that was the origin of Silent Night. Now this morning I want us to take a look at another Christmas song written by a priest. Not an Austrian priest, but actually a Jewish priest, and not written in 1816, but actually written at the time of Christ. In the Bible, in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, we actually find four Christmas songs. I call them the original Christmas carols. One was written by Mary. One was written by uh, an old man in the temple by the name of Simeon. Uh, another came from the heavenly choir of angels. And the one that we're going to look at this morning, as I mentioned, was written by a Jewish priest by the name of Zacharias. Now, as interesting as the background of Silent Night is, it doesn't compare to the background of this song, this Christmas song written by Zacharias. If you have your Bible with you, turn to Luke chapter 1. As I mentioned, Zacharias was a priest. At the time of Jesus, there were about 18,000 priests in Israel. Now, the priests were divided into 24 divisions. David did that back in his day. So if you have 18,000 priests divided into 24 different divisions, that would be about 750 priests in the average division. Now, what they would do, since there were 24 divisions, is twice a year, for one week at a time, a division of priests would come to Jerusalem, and they would minister in the temple. Luke chapter 1 verse 8. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. What they would do with the priest is each morning they would draw lots to see who would do what job, who would do what ministry. And on this occasion, the lot fell to Zecharias to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now, for most priests, this was a once-in-a-lifetime event. 
Because only one person would go in at a time to the altar of incense and burn incense on the altar. And with so many priests and so many divisions, uh, chances are you would never get that opportunity. But if you did, it would probably be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Zechariah goes into the temple, he goes into the holy place, and as he's burning incense on the altar of incense, an angel appears to him, the angel Gabriel, and Gabriel has a message for him. He tells Zechariah that he and his wife Elizabeth will have a son, and they will name that son John. Later on, you and I will know him as John the Baptist. Verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. The angel answered, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and to bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you'll be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you didn't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zechariah and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he couldn't speak to them. And they perceived that he'd seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. After they go back home, they also receive a visit from Elizabeth's cousin, who's named Mary, and Mary tells them an equally incredible story. She has been visited by the very same angel Gabriel with a message that Mary will give birth to the Messiah himself. That's the background for Zechariah's Christmas carol. Uh, by the way, you might think, how did he sing a Christmas song uh, if he was speechless? It says in verse 59, So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zechariah. His mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John. But they said to her, There's no one among your relatives who's called by this name. So they made signs to his father what he would have him called. He asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, His name is John. So they all marveled immediately. His mouth was opened, and his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, praising God. His song, like a lot of songs, has three stanzas or three main thoughts to it, and that's what I want us to look at this morning. The first verse of Zechariah's song is about salvation. Verse 68, blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he, that's God, has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father, Abraham. Zechariah mentions Abraham when he's, when he's talking about salvation because Abraham tells us how we can be saved. Romans chapter 4 verse 3 says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. You know, Abraham's sins weren't forgiven because he kept the Ten Commandments. Abraham's sins weren't forgiven because he celebrated all the feast. Abraham's sins weren't forgiven because he kept the law. Because all of these things didn't happen, all of these things weren't put into place till 400 years after Abraham. And it tells us all about that in the book of Galatians. So how was Abraham saved? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. When Abraham believed God, God looked on him and he credited him with righteousness. Now what was it that Abraham believed? 
If you're familiar with the story of Abraham, a, an event that, that points out all of this happens in Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, God gave Abraham a test. God visited Abraham one night, and he spoke to him, and he said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, and offer him up as a sacrifice. By the way, who does that remind you? Who, took, who allowed their only son to be offered up as a sacrifice? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God took his son Isaac to Mount Moriah, and Isaac himself carried the wood that he would be sacrificed on. Who does that make you think of? Jesus carried the cross to Calvary that he would be sacrificed on. Uh, but then... God provided a substitute. If you're familiar with the story, he's ready to obey God. And he trusts God. He knows somehow my son has to live because God has made all these promises that he's going to fulfill through Isaac. And he believed that if he, had, if he had killed his son, that God would have raised him from the dead. But God had something else in mind. When he's ready to, to, to kill his son, there was a ram caught in a thicket. And God said, don't kill your son. Take the, take the ram and kill that ram instead of your son in your son's place. Listen carefully to what Abraham named the place. Genesis chapter 22, verse 14. Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. You would think that Abraham would have named the place the Lord provided. He provided that ram in the thicket. In the mount of the Lord it was provided. But instead he names it the Lord will provide. You see, Abraham understood all of this was pointing forward to a, to a future event. In verse 8, Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Who was going to be the sacrifice? It would be God himself. And that's the Christmas message. That God himself became a man and came into the world and died on the cross as a sacrifice for you and me. He died in our stead. He died in our place. The second verse of Zechariah's song is about sanctification. I see this in verse 75. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. A sanctification means to be set apart. God wants you to be set apart. God wants you to be different. Jesus prayed to the Father, and he was praying for his disciples that were then there and his disciples that were still to come. And he said this, I don't pray that you should take them out of the world. Well, how can we be set apart while we're still in the world? Paul tells us how in Philippians chapter 2, that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. God wants you to, to stand out in a good way. Uh, imagine a, a carton of eggs a carton with 12 eggs in it. And from a distance, they might all look the same. But then closer up and on closer examination, you notice that one is, it's different. It's set apart. There are 11 plastic eggs and there's one real egg. Well, what's the difference between the two? Well, the difference is what's on the inside. And that's how God wants us to be set apart. He leaves us in the world, but we're to shine as lights in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation, God says. There's supposed to be something different about us. 
If you get Christmas cards, probably there's a good chance that there's a, a verse from John's Gospel on the front of one of your Christmas cards. John chapter 1, verse 14 says this, The Word, that's Jesus Christ, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You and I, we need to be like Jesus. We need to be filled with grace and with truth. A mom named Kate posted something recently that showed what a gracious life looks like. She wrote, there's a little girl in my son Nicholas's class. I'll call her E. Nicholas and E just met this year in kindergarten. They like to play outside together. They like to sit with each other in school. They even like to hold hands. You may think this is a typical friendship story, a, a cute little love story, but this is different. This is a story of inclusion, acceptance, and kindness. Nicholas has autism and is in the special education class at school. He spends most of his day in therapies and learning life skills to help him be as independent as he can. Throughout the day, he spends time in the general education kindergarten class. He participates in morning circle time with them where they read books, learn the letters of the alphabet, dance, and sing songs. Nicholas also plays outside at recess with them. This is the class that E is in. E always sits by Nicholas. She always grabs his hand. They spend a lot of time together when they can. The most beautiful thing about their friendship is how she talks to him. She talks to him even though he can't talk back. She understands he doesn't talk, but she does it anyway. This is inclusion. E hangs out with Nicholas despite him having a disability. She wants to be friends with him, even though he's different from her. This is acceptance. E understands Nicholas can't communicate as she can. She accepts him anyway. She knows he, th he thinks and processes things a little slower than other kids. She still gravitates toward him. This is kindness. E is nice to Nicholas. She doesn't pick on him because he's different. She doesn't treat him any less because he has autism. E has a beautiful heart. I reached out to her mom to express my gratitude for raising such a thoughtful daughter. I learned that E talks about Nicholas all the time at home. She truly loves being with him. And Nicholas really enjoys her company too. Now that we're doing remote learning, he doesn't get to see her in person. However, he still gets excited when he sees her on the computer. He knows who she is and understands she's his friend. He made a card for her on her birthday. As a mother to a child with special needs, it melts my heart to see somebody accept my son for who he is. I love that Nicholas has a genuine friendship with this little girl. I'm thankful that my son is being included at school. I'm thankful that Nicholas has a friend like E in his life. I'm grateful E has parents who taught her what it means to accept people who are different from her. E has given me hope for my son's future. She doesn't try to change him. She likes him just the way he is. A true friendship is when someone knows everything about you but likes you anyway. That's exactly how E is. That's a, a grace filled life. See, and here's the thing, we need grace, but, but we also need truth. This is where most of us struggle. Most of us are usually heavy on one and light on the other, if you know what I mean. There are, there are people that they're, they're heavy on grace. They're kind, they're forgiving, they're considerate, but very often, the people that are heavy on grace are light on the truth. They find it hard to be totally honest with people. They find it hard to say things that other people won't like or other people won't accept, even if they need to hear them. Uh, other people, they're, they're heavy on the truth, but they're light on grace. They can say the difficult things, and they do say the difficult things. But very often they don't say it and express it in a, in a kind and a compassionate way. Jesus Christ was filled with grace and truth.
And that's what we need. We need to be filled with grace and truth. By the way, John the Baptist was. He was filled with grace. For a while it seemed like everyone was following John the Baptist, but his attitude for, towards Jesus, he was filled with grace. They asked him about Jesus. He said, I'm not even worthy to un unstrap his sandal. People started to follow Jesus, and he said, he must increase and I must decrease. He, he was filled with grace. But he was also a truth teller. He told the truth even when it was hard, even when people didn't want to hear it. And it's because he told the truth that, that he was thrown in prison, and it was because he told the truth that he was eventually executed. He told the truth even when it was hard to hear. And that leads us to the third verse of Zechariah's song. The third verse of Zechariah's song is about service. Verse 74, that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Do you remember what Jesus said about him coming into the world? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Serving God and serving others gives life meaning. The Chinese have a proverb. If you want to be happy for an hour, take a nap. <laughs> that sounds good to me. I could stop that proverb right at that point. But it goes on, if you want to be happy for an hour, take a nap. If you want to be happy for a day, go fishing. If you want to be happy for a year, inherit a fortune. If you want to be happy for a lifetime, help somebody. It's the way God designed us. A teacher gave his class an assignment. He said, I want you to do two things this week, and then I want you to wait, to, to wait about a month, and then you're going to write about both experiences. He, he said, what I want you to do first of all is, he said, I want you to do something that you want to do, something that brings you pleasure, something that brings you joy. Hang out with your friends, go to a ball game, go to a movie, just do something that, that you like, just, just something for yourself. And he said, and then, then on another day, I want you to do something totally selfless. Something maybe that you don't even want to do. But do something that helps someone else. Uh, shovel someone's snow, rake someone's leaves, don't take any payment. Do something kind for someone that they don't even know about. Well, they all did that, and a month later he gave them the assignment, and the assignment was this. Write about each one of the experiences and how it made you felt. To a person, as they wrote about their experiences, all of them wrote that when they did the pleasurable thing, when they did something for themselves, they, they felt good, but it didn't really last. I, I mean, it felt good while they were doing it, while they were at the movie, while they were out to dinner or whatever it was, but then, then it was gone like that. But a month later, ha, huh, the glow from serving someone else, ah, oh, they could still feel it. There, there was just this feeling of rightness, this feeling of fulfillment that came from doing that. And the reason for that is that you were created by God in his image. And you are most fulfilled when you show love like Jesus showed love and when you serve others like Jesus served others. In verse 76, Zechariah states how his son John was going to serve God. And you, child will be called the prophet of the highest. For you'll go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. 
John prepared people to receive Jesus. Uh, John told people how they could have their, their sins forgiven. And you and I, we've been called to the same mission. This morning, you have an opportunity to say yes to God. You have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Will you say yes to salvation? The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Just like Abraham. Your sins won't be forgiven by keeping the commandments and doing good works. Your sins will be forgiven if you believe in him, if you trust in him that Christ came into the world and he died on a cross and he was the sacrifice for your sins. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Will you say yes to sanctification? God wants you to be different, to shine as a light in a dark world, to be filled with grace and truth. And will you say yes to service? It's the way you were created. It's the only way you'll, you'll really be fulfilled. Because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. This morning as we close in prayer, I'd like for us to close with a special Christmas benediction from Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Amen.